Good. Um, <clears throat> this morning again, I trust we all came with expectations and uh, with an open heart to learn. You know, as I uh, ponder those details, I shiver and uh, feel inadequate to stand here because, you know, I, I look at my own weakness. As I sat in church and as I was contemplating on the message that I felt the Lord had laid on my heart many weeks ago, I realized all of a sudden that this is a message that speaks to us and not me to you. And so that gave me courage to step up and realize I'm just one of us. And, and I want you to listen as such as well, as that as well. <clears throat> you know, sometimes it seems like the good Lord leads me or leads us into uh, life examples that are so well fitting uh, of the message that I think maybe they are even divinely led that way. One of those this morning was, and it's not untypical at our home that these occasions happen, but I get out of bed a little bit earlier, typically, and especially if I have stuff to prepare, I try to get a little bit earlier, uh, get an earlier start. So I'm here studying this very message. I am being blessed. I enjoy the studies. Uh, typically, I enjoy them. Uh, they bless me. And so I'm peacefully, very comfortably sitting in my office studying what I think is very important and uh, enjoy it. In fact, I think that this is something that you should all enjoy. As the day unfolds, you know, sooner or later my wife comes up and she sticks her head into my office. Her first question is, how can you live in here? Oh, I say, I, uh, this is very comfortable. Well, there's no error, and you know, you must have used that wonder balsam or something again. And, uh, oh, oh, that's the impression you get. I'm just thoroughly blessed, and this is, this is life to me, but I realize that it will take quite a bit for me to convince her to come in and say, hey, you know what, I love you. Come and sit on my lap. Let's, let's start the day right, okay? That's the very thing that happened this morning. She came in and, and we had a good time. That, that's typical. <clears throat> Later, as I thought on the whole scene, I realized that this is actually very real to the message that I have to preach. Would you be willing to come into a room where there's no appeal. In this case, no air. That's how some people label it. I, you know, I never got the gift of knowing when there's no air, but <clears throat> some people have. So how would you make a room that has no air attractive to somebody that needs air and say, come into here and we will close the door as is it so far and you will start to really think that you are in the right place. What would it take for you to get somebody and enthused about joining you? It's easy for you to understand that that's not going to be easy. Never mind the smell. So what would it take? The stuff that I'm reading is life-changing material. It has changed my life. It will change everybody's life. It is critically important that we read the stuff. Now, in this case, of course, you could read it outside of the room as well. But for me to now stand in that room and say, just change your mind and come in and be okay, you would probably say, Ron, you know what? No, no, that's not how it works. Fix the details, make it appealing, and then it's going to work. Today, the topic of the message is, and this topic, I've worked on this many weeks, so uh, last Sunday... Lana sent a message, and his message was something like, uh, to fulfill the purpose of God, you have to use his methods. I think that's how it was. The, mess the, the topic today is finding purpose, or let me say finding more purpose in Christian living. Perhaps some have a hard time to understand how we could even have purpose in Christian living. 
or the others might sit here and say, like, why even such a message? It's, it's like very clear. There's a lot of purpose in my Christian life. Why will you even have it in a question for? Yet every Christian is challenged many times in his life to somehow meet times where we seem to somehow lose purpose in our Christian life. And so my prayer has been that this message could just again bring back that life if it has faded. If somebody would come to you and say, what's the purpose of your Christian life? You know, it would make a good conversation. <clears throat> Some of us might say, oh, I want to go to heaven. That is a good, that is a real, real reason to be a Christian. I have a, an interesting question, and this is not necessarily a real question. <clears throat> if you would never make it to heaven, let's say you would just die like some people claim, that we all die like animals. There's, the end of life is the end of it all. <clears throat> if you knew there was no eternity, yet there would be Christian living, would you still choose to be a Christian? Maybe that's a question that we cannot figure out. My reason of the question is, then in that case, you would have to say, oh, I would need to know why I would be a Christian. If there's no eternal value, no eternal benefit, then so why would I be a Christian? And so my, my heart has been that when we think of today's message, we think of our Christian living between the time we became a Christian and the time that we die. That's the window we want to talk about. We're not going to dwell much on eternal values of Christianity, but it is in the time of our life. <clears throat> there was the story in Luke chapter 10, verse 27. It's the lawyer, and he is also wondering about life, and you find it in, in verse 27 that... Um, <clears throat> He got the answer, verse 27. It's in verse 25, I believe. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 25. He's the, asking the question. A certain lawyer stood up and tempted it, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That was the question over life. What shall I do? He had a good question. Jesus gave him this answer. This answer is very critical for us to also grab the uh, um, wrap that wrap around our arms around it in order to find purpose in our Christian living. He answering, this is verse 27, Jesus now answers and says, Thou shalt love God, thy God, with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy might and thy neighbor as thyself. This is the core, this is the foundation of your life. That's all he said him, told him. <clears throat> This do, verse, um, next verse, at the end of the verse, Jesus says, this do and thou shalt live. I like that word live. I've always liked it. It speaks of the nowadays. <clears throat> then follows the story of the good Samaritan. That's the three men. <clears throat> we always like to dwell on the good Samaritan and that's okay. But there was the three men. These three men, <clears throat> they are all part of the picture and they all wanted to go to heaven. We can trust that. And so they all had a life to live. The priest, he had a life to live and he just lived by his habits. His habitual living made him pass by without capturing the opportunity to do well. The Levite, who was also a very good man, he too followed his habits and wasn't thinking of the need of the, uh, of the uh, <clears throat> man in need. The Samaritan comes by and he too just did what his habit would make him do. And he saw the need. Why was the actions of these three men so different? Have you ever thought about that? Of course, we have all already said, oh, I wish I was a good Samaritan. Well, amen, I wish that too. You know, in fact, I just really wish I was a good Samaritan. Right now, as I'm standing in front of you, I really wish I was a good Samaritan. I'm not exactly sure tomorrow when you know what, I'll be interrupted and I'll find out, oh, this doesn't work in my life. My day is somewhat disrupted now. If that feeling of a good Samaritan will truly grip my heart and I'll continue being that. But right now, every one of us would really raise his hand and say, yes, I want to be a good Samaritan. 
that test is likely coming to you tomorrow. And then your habits will tell how it works, how we really are. <clears throat> Why did they see the situation so different? So let's just picture an unbeliever. He is standing at a distance and he is watching all of this. There's three believing people. We don't know not much of the Samaritan's faith, but we trust that he, had a, he was a good man. But here's an unbeliever witnessing this scene. He's standing on the hill and he's watching. Can I ask you a question today? To which of the three men's religion will he want to listen? Well, that's pretty obvious. Why? He hasn't spoken to the priest who knows it all. The priest is well educated and he likely has a heritage of many generations of priests. So he's like the good quality people. The Levites, he was just more fortunate and he's just being born into being a Levite. I mean, if you were born a Levite, you had very little to do. You just went straight to the good side. And then there was the Samaritan. We don't know much about him. <clears throat> to which of the three will the unbeliever say, oh, that's the one. The day that I will want life, I'm going to Mr. Samaritan. Obviously, right? What was wrong with the Levite? I'm sure he could have spoken so good words. A priest, likewise. They could have spoken all these words so well. What turned the unbeliever that we see in the woods uh, uh, watching this, what would turn him off from the first two? I'll let you answer that for yourself. It's not their faith. It's not their um, reputation necessarily. It's not their family necessarily. So what was it? I said I would let you answer that by yourself. But I'll give you an answer. One of that would be, and probably the main one was, their actions. Or the lack of the actions in this case. So what we need to realize, and my dear church family, this is the part that's important to me. This decision, we're having the fifth person in this Samaritan story this morning, and that's the one that we make, just make an imaginary character who's watching the scene. He has firmly concluded his decision before he spoke a single word to any of these men. Do you believe that that still works that way? Could the priest have just continued walking and thinking if there would be an unbeliever somewhere's watching this, this that I'm walking here, he will just right away say, oh yeah, he's a good man. I would wish to be like him. He could have thought that. So could the Levite and perhaps the Samaritan as well. But there was something that had happened at the scene that completely convinced the, the imaginary character this morning to go where he would go when he needed something. You and I actually do the same thing. Have you ever thought about that? <clears throat> Very often before we know the culture, before we know the religion, or before we know the, your home or your home church or your family, we already have made conclusions about people. There is just simply no avoidance. You and I cannot avoid these things. So that is on the trail that I want to lead us this morning when we think of purpose in Christianity. Our purpose needs, uh, sorry, our, our purpose in Christianity needs or has to show in our conduct. <clears throat> Maybe I should just say it does it anyway. Whatever you do, it shows it anyway. So don't try to be something as a show who you really aren't. <clears throat> Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. That's what caught my attention weeks ago. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And uh, 
We will just go a little bit faster this morning. It's a good chapter. You, you start in verse chapter 12. It speaks about the gifts. And then he turns it into the love chapter, verse 13. And then in chap- uh, chapter 13 and then in chapter 14, he seems to come back to the gifts again. <clears throat> and that's a good chapter. I would like to spend a lot of time in there. Maybe you can do that <clears throat> in your Sunday school one of these days. But so 1 Corinthians 14 gives you the idea, very disordered church. Some spoke in tongues and some prophesied and others did other good things. Good people in that sense, very disorganized. And uh, maybe even disunified. I'm not exactly sure on those matters. But anyway, we come to verse 23. And uh, <clears throat> here's a quick description of the church. I read this and as I was reading it, I thought, oh boy, this could be IMF church. Like, look at, look at this. If therefore the whole church, we are here, you know, balcony almost full, the whole church be come together into one place. That's us this morning, okay? Look at this thing. And then it says, and all speak with tongues. Tongues, speaking in tongues means that we speak different languages. Oh, I I've sometimes wish that we could speak in tongues, but we can speak different languages. In fact, this morning, you could just like that, we could start four different languages right among us, right here. We could speak in four different languages, no problem at all. Some of us would just have no idea what the other was saying because we don't know that language. So let's say we're all now in our four different languages. Maybe it's even five. I'm not sure how many it is. But anyway, we would all speak in the different language all at the same time. And there came in those that are unlearned. Okay, so some of you would now say, oh, that's me. I'm the unlearned one. I cannot, you know, I don't know this stuff. Okay, so there comes in the unlearned. And the unbeliever. Oh, yeah, so three different kinds of people in this church. The ones that spoke in tongues, and then the unlearned, and then also the unbeliever. We could actually do quite a bit of that right here this morning if we chose to. Will they not say that ye are mad? Have you ever thought about people walking out of IMF church, and they would go home, and they would talk to their, themselves in their, in their vehicle on their way home, say, these people were mad in the church. I didn't get in the thing. Just a bunch of mad people. And the children would say, Mom and Dad, let's go back next Sunday. I like this mad stuff. Very likely not. They would say, yeah, we need to go somewhere where it makes sense, okay? Let's keep reading. Verse 24. But, oh, now we have a different idea. But if all prophesy. Now that word prophesy, that is a word that you, as you read it in the New Testament, understand this part. It is not always meant as in telling future events. It can be that, but it's also often used more in the term of teaching. And so, but if all prophesy, you could read, if all teach, it's hard to understand how we would all get up and start teaching, but, you know, it seems like these were all teachers, which is good. And there came in one that believed not. Okay, now we have the same situation, but we do church different now. We all prophesy, and the one comes and believes not. Or the unlearned, even the unlearned, they're both back next Sunday, and he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. You know what, it is moving, it is making sense. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down, here is what, the other day as I was reading this, I was just thinking, Lord help us to be, help me to be this kind of a person. Where the unbeliever or the unlearned all of a sudden just falls down. That's what it says. He falls down, and what does, he, what does he do? Say, oh, I'm so very unlearned, you know, I can speak only one language. No, it says, falls down on his face and he will worship God. That is you and me living a worship service that has that impact on the unbeliever. But this is where it goes on. After he's done worshiping God, he now also goes home based on what we read here. And it says, and report that God is in you of a truth. That's the words that I underlined in my Bible. You think that that's happening in your life or in my life, that people, when they're done with your and my conversation, that they say, God of a truth is in that person. That's the purpose that we're talking about today. Back to uh, Marcella and my morning start here. 
Probably if you would have asked her, she would have said, no air in that room. What else is there? I don't know. I just know that part. People were in this church here in 1 Corinth, and they knew just a bunch of disorder, but what else is there? I don't know. There was the power of God was there, but it just turned them off. It turned them off. You know, chances is that you and I could be those same kind of Christians. God forbid, and this is where my heart is for my own life. This is where I said before I started to preach that the message is to us. It's not to you, it's to us. How much inventory do you take in your life and realize that you have habitual things in your life that block out the power of God to the public? I'm asking myself the same question. Matthew 5, 14, the words of Jesus. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light, your light, our light, so shine before men. What's going to happen? They will start to talk about it. Your light will be noticed. My light will be noticed. And people will start to talk about our light. I say they will start. They already are talking. Like that's already in the goal. But it says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. Can I ask you a question? Not that we want to brag about ourselves, but we want to just simply, seriously ask ourselves the question. How many times do you think that people have used your name and say, the, the life or the God that this person serves, that is the life you want to go? I've said it of other people. You know what? It's not necessary that I need to find out, hey, what do people talk about me? Like, that's not the intent of the message. The intent of the message, though, is what do people think when they see me? When I heard that Henry Friesen had died, <clears throat> I remember uh, years ago that every time he was still more walking, you would see him in town sometimes. But every time when I saw Mr. Friesen, I say this to his, to his goodwill or to his na good name, but every time when I saw Mr. Friesen on the street, it instantly made me think that that man lives a faith that I wish I had. He didn't need to say anything at the moment, but that was just who he was. May God just rise up more man like that. Why was it that way? Not because of his physical looks, but because of the works that I knew he was working or had worked. <clears throat> So what is it when we would call the light is covered? <clears throat> when we say the light is covered, we, we, we see this, and that is I'm bringing it back to my morning hour. I thought it was all right in the room because I didn't notice anything wrong but the outsiders instantly notice there's something not right. And that's the main thing they see at their first glance. A light covered in the bushel is a light. We have to understand that. So the light under the bushel thinks that it's shining, if a light could think. It's comfortable in there, and it sees no reason to change. After all, it's nice and bright. But the cover of the light makes the light useless. How would you and I cover our light? I know years ago when I uh, was able to change my lifestyle in this area, and I had a desire, had had the desire for many years already, that I wished to be interacting a lot more with local people. Just neighborhood people. I, uh, <clears throat> I had a good job, but somehow the job always took me out of the community and not so much in the community. <clears throat> I always desired to be a community person. 
And so the day came and I've been able to be that for the last 10 years, much more so. And it has blessed me abundantly. You know, and to, to get to the point where you get a, relatively a stranger into uh, your office or presence and ask them the question. And you, you, you hear it out, you listen it out. What does this person think of me? Or what does this person much more so think of my people, if I can use the term this morning? You know, it's seldom that you get people to speak openly, but there is some that do. And uh, sometimes I've thought, okay, now what's my responsibility to do when you hear people say negative things? You know, very often they say positive. It's so much easier to speak the positive things. But what about the negative things? These are very often the covers over the, the lights, and we think they're totally okay, perhaps. If people would say, oh, your people, pointing to me, say Many of them are very self-focused. They seem to be just focusing on their own need or their own family. Very, very protective. To the point where it starts to feel that I'm, in their eyes, a danger. That doesn't appeal. Or if they say, and they say this, that they seem to be very, your people seem to be very attracted to money. As soon as they hear money, their ears prick up. Some get involved when it comes to very improper jokes that are shameful, but yet your people seem to be enthused about that. Or the other one says, good people, but very impolite, very impolite. Their driving habits make me mad. This is what somebody told me. They seem to think that they're alone on the road. Even though I'm there, they still drive same speed as if they were by themselves. Or their bright lights are always on. Inconsiderate of others. Unconcerned how they make me feel. unaware, but sometimes seems like they make themselves look good. Through the years, these are things that people have told me. And then in return, I like to offer Christ. This is where I'm coming back to my office this morning. It's hard for me to convince my wife, say, just come in, close the door. This is the best place for you to be. If my impression to the unbeliever is negative, he is not going to listen to my love that I have for Christ. Very likely not. Because that's the front that I give. That's the bushel over my candle. And people watch us, and rightly so. Most people never say anything. This has been sort of my thing trying to get impressions. Years ago, that wasn't here, and I'm almost done here, but this is how it works. Many times you will be identified with your culture. Many times you will be identified with your family, and many times you will be identified with your church. And that is why it is very important that every one of us realize that we have a much bigger purpose than just our own. We were... uh, visiting in Mexico. This is years ago. I came across a a total unknown uh, person, a stranger to me, but he was obviously of a one that was willing to share his mind. And so uh, we got into a good conversation. It was at my father-in-law's place, uh, my parent-in-law's place. And so he soon got off and he asked me the question, why do you, and he pointed to me exactly, he said, why do you bring your young people to the street and have them drink alcohol? And then the life that follows with that. And I was offended. I didn't think that I was part of that. But I realized that he painted everybody with the same brush because of the culture that I was part of. It hurt to think about that. That how that impression left me somewhat handicapped to witness to this person. 
Our rudeness among our people is our own destruction. When we lose our purpose, and you know what? I meant to bring a book. I didn't bring the book, but I, I'll give you the, the topic, In His Steps. That's a book you can buy at, in Evergreen. I'm pretty sure you can buy it here at Evergreen Store. In His Steps. Uh, it's a wonderful book to read on this very subject. I have asked the question to others, and I'm asking myself the question to myself. Are you concerned? That your example, as you walk down the street, as you are a coworker, as you interact with people, is it truly your concern? And I'm asking you the question today, and I want to put myself under the same question. But I'm asking us the question, is it your concern that your works, that your words, that your ways of living will promote the person that hears your words, your way of living, that watches us, that your actions will bring them to glorify God. What's the agenda? What's the purpose? Have we lost it? Do we need a revival in it? I want to conclude. <clears throat> Proverbs 4 verse 18, I like the verse, but the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more. Unto the perfect day, Philippians 2.14. Another wonderful verse. Do all things without murmurings. Oh, brother and sister, this is where you and I as God's people are different than the rest. We don't murmur. Even though we are challenged, even though our freedom might be challenged, we don't murmur. We have a better call. We don't dispute that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. What a wonderful opportunity to be standing out as sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked. Has somebody felt like we lived in a crooked situation in the last few years? I have. I think we all can identify somewhat with that. So that in the midst of a crooked and a perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in this world, you know what? The opportunities are, are coming more than ever that our lights will shine and they need to shine. <clears throat> I want to close with this verse, 1 Peter 2 verse 12. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, ye may be, nope, sorry, that they may by your good works which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of salvation. My time is up. I wanted to add the second part to this chapter, but it's that, that's the prophecies of the Old Testament and how the world will one day turn to the Jews because the world will have seen the Jews, the Jews' God. Read for yourself. It's truly an amazing thing how our example will and do impact this world, this community around us. Are you concerned that your works will bring glory to the name of God? If that is not your number one, my number one concern, we are in the wrong place. It needs to be of great purpose. Tomorrow when the day starts or before this day is over, Let's make sure and let's start every day with the, with the prayer that we are here. God, I'm here to let my works be of such that the people that will watch me will glorify your name. God bless you. <clears throat>